For example, the 50s, the Sands Hotel, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and all that stuff, Nat King Cole, all those great stars of the last, the last century, run by a bunch of guys from the Copacabana in New York City, nightclub people and rowdies that had been running illegal casinos in the East Coast who came to Las Vegas looking for a safe harbor where they could raise their children without being raided by the sheriff for, crap, for running a crap game that was illegal. In the 60s, a guy showed up in Las Vegas, a roly-poly, pathological liar, a gifted and inspirational character named Jay Sarno, who was deeply affected by the Fauna Blue Hotel in, Las, in, in Miami Beach. The Fauna Blue Hotel is the foundation stud of destination resorts. The Novak family built that place in the 50s. It opened, I believe, in 54. So profoundly better and more imaginative than anything that had been built in Florida or anywhere else, that the hotel was the most successful place any destination in the winter months. It didn't even have a sign on the building, and everybody wanted to go there. From Latin America, from Europe, they all came. The Jews and Italians from New York, every guy with money, every, every sporting life type of guy had to be at the Fauna Blue Hotel in January, February, and March. Jay Sar, I was there, my family lived in Miami Beach while I was going to college, and they even had a cabana at the Fauna Blue, and I remember being very seriously affected by seeing this fella, the, 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 there were two brothers, Joe and Ben Novak, Joe Novak died, but Ben Novak and his wife Bernice ended up being the, uh, the, the proprietors in residence. And my parents and everybody else just talked about them she was a beautiful, glamorous woman, and he was a, a bantam, uh, Napoleonic kind of character. And I noticed as a young man, I was very impressionable in my adolescent years, and I formed a, a, an adolescent and naive notion watching Ben Novak strut around the hotel that owning a destination resort hotel was a pretty good way of going. I noticed that no, nobody ever got abused, an owner never got abused on his own property. It was good to be king if you were Ben Novak. <laughs> that was that naive, immature notion I had in the late 50s as I was getting ready to graduate college and in my first year at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And as, as years later, when I got in that position, it turns out that my naive and adolescent notions were remarkably accurate. <laughs> it's that good. <laughs> so that's what Las Vegas has been. And the more perfectly it responded to the appetite of, of, of society for a place that was imaginative and jazzy and action-packed where you could go and stay up late, it's done well. Nothing's changed. Sure, the offers, it became a great retail city. No one expected that. It became a great culinary center. Nobody expected that. There were personalities along the way that contributed to these sort of uh, significant developments. Wolfgang Puck came and opened the restaurants, and that started that. Retail stores started to bloom, and people, and, and all of a sudden we discovered amazingly that if people are on vacation, they like to shop. So we figured it out. Not overnight, but in a nice stepped evolutionary way, for the past 40 or 50 years, Las Vegas has evolved to what it is today. With 150,000 rooms, that's a lot. Along the way, because of a man named Perry Thomas, public companies were allowed to come in, and that opened the door to public financing. And money became available in much larger amounts. In 1978, there's a man in this room named Stanley Zacks. That's one of my best friends. He's chairman of Zenith National Insurance. And he was my buddy, and I was struggling with a $5 million company, the Golden Nugget downtown, to enter the market in Atlantic City, which required $100 million at least. And Stanley watched me. He was vice chairman of Hilton in those days, early days, and he said, look, uh, you're not going to do this unless you meet my cousin Mike. And Stanley, I had my leg in a cast. I had broken my foot running cross country, and I was on crutches in August 1978. And I went up to Drexel Burnham's offices on 1900 Avenue or 1700 Avenue of the Stars. 
And I went to a floor with an unmarked door. I walked in and Stanley was standing there with a short sleeve shirt in the hot summer months next to a young man with jeans and a Madras shirt who I thought was a clerk. And I came in under crutches and the kid standing next to Stanley said, you look like you're very uncomfortable. Why don't you step into this conference room? Let's put your foot up. Can I get you, would you like a drink? He said, well, yes, I'd like a Diet Coke, thank you. And I said, well, they've they got very nice people here. And I looked at Stanley, I said, well, I can't wait to meet your, the guru, your cousin, Mike Milken. He said, you just did. <laughs> he was 32 years old, he looked like he was about 18. That began my education in capital structure. I became Michael's first client in gaming, and that was very important to both of us. First of all, because my education began in capital structure, and that affected me. I was 36 at a very early age, and I learned the fundamental lessons that I've never forgotten, and I've conducted my business that way ever since. Michael was responsible. If Perry Thomas and the Valley Bank were the first wave of development in Las Vegas, the town soon, the town and the businesses outgrew the capacity of those banks to lend. And at that moment, thanks to Stanley, Michael Milken stepped up and Drexel Burnham took over the gaming industry. I became sort of the show pony of that. Financing Atlantic City was more venture capital than, than finance, but we made promises that we kept. The funds in Boston, Putnam, Keystone, Fidelity, they got units deals on the mortgage, you know, they got a good coupon plus warrants. They made money on the warrants. They made money on the stock. I redeemed the paper in three years and went to non-recourse financing and the subs, a, a practice we follow to this day in order to get the longest maturities, the lowest interest rate and the fewest covenants. Subsidiary financing, non-recourse to the parent. Maintain your flexibility in the parent keep the subs isolated and well-financed. Anyway, Milken took over financing of Las Vegas and it bloomed. I introduced Mike and, and one of his colleagues, John Kissick, who was on my board, was in charge of the LA corporate finance operation. And Kissick, I introduced him to Circus Circus. Mike picked up Circus. He picked up Bally and Caesars, et cetera, et cetera. And the rest is history. Four billion dollars worth of financing took Las Vegas to another level. Okay. So here comes Las Vegas into the 90s and Mirage comes along. We spent $600 million, six, over $600 million on a town, in a town where no one had ever spent more than $200 million. I remember that showing the model of Mirage at, at, at a press conference when we unveiled this, you know, the scale model. And everybody went, oh my God. And the price was, you know, ridiculously orders of magnitude more expensive. But it was the first 3,000 room hotel built in one crack. You know, it, it wasn't like we were just overpriced what, what was there before. This was a hotel that had tremendous, tremendous additional facilities compared to anything that was in town. No hotel in the world had ever been built with 3,000 rooms from scratch, you know, right out, of the, right out of the chute. I remember saying at that press conference, and the governor was there at that day, this will be a good investment for the shareholders of Golden Nugget. That was the name of the company in those days. It became known later as Mirage. This will be a good investment for the, for the stockholders of my company. But what will be most important about the Mirage, I believe, is that it will show that Las Vegas is a safe place to invest over a half a billion dollars because of the stability of the political situation and the history of this market which at that point was 25 or 30 years old. I did not realize how prophetic that statement was going to mean I was purely lucky because the, the place opened in 89 on November 22nd, the anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. And everything after that was history. The 90s saw a boom in Las Vegas that was quite extraordinary. Hotel after hotel were built. Some of them very well conceived. Some, as usual, not so well conceived. So we hit the millennium, and I think that's about enough history.